Welcome to the Profitable Soul Ed Business Summit. I'm Jenny Rogers, your host, and I'm here with Cater Brown. He's a ceremonialist and the founder of the Rites of Passage Council, and he's going to start us off with an invocation. Cater? Thank you, Jenny. It's a real honor to be here. And um, in keeping with the theme of this summit, I wanted to begin with an invocation um, that's to those... Uh, sources of support and power that guide our souls. So with that, I want to invite everybody for a moment to close your eyes and imagine one of those favorite places in nature and see yourself standing there in the morning at sunrise, facing the sun. And with much gratitude, with open hearts, with clear hearts, and with humble hearts, we call upon the good medicine keepers of the East, the place of the rising sun, the place of fresh new beginnings, seeing things for the first time every time, the good medicine of hawk and eagle and condor and all those high flyers that teach us how to see the big picture and how to focus on the tiny details. To that good medicine in the East that provides connection and inspiration. With much gratitude, we acknowledge you. We call upon your assistance. To give us adequate words to speak to this emerging energy on the planet now. With much gratitude, we welcome you. Uh -huh. And take a quarter turn to the South now facing the noonday sun, the direction of summer, and warm summer breezes, the place of inspiration, creativity, the place of action, movement, the place where we manifest our visions. We call upon that beautiful medicine of the South to awaken within us that courage to step into the center of the fire of our being to live from a place of integrity, that place where our words and our thoughts and our feelings and our actions are exactly the same. A place of courage and impeccability and integrity. And also laughter and playfulness. We call upon the good medicine of the South to step into this global summit with us and awaken within each one of us that bone memory where you live. Oh, and then quarter turn again, we face west. I'm calling upon the season of autumn, that season in which we have just moved into, that place of the harvest, that place of turning inward, sap, receiving on the vines, gathering the nourishment from the fields, Turning inward, turning inward and downward into the sacred waters. The place of healing and reconciliation, and soul and memory. We call upon the good medicine of the West. We invite you into the circle to awaken within each one of us that bone memory where you live as well. So, quarter turn again to the North. We call upon the spirit of winter the good medicine, the beautiful people of the North, story keepers, the elders, turning towards the sacred mountain, spirit of winter in the place of deep peace and letting go. For those beautiful ones of elk, it teaches how to go the long and steady distance. Bison, who teaches about the giveaway and prayerfulness and abundance. We call upon that spirit of the North that reminds us how to let go so completely and accept ourselves in that letting go, to let go so completely that spring simply shows up because we let go enough. With much gratitude to the beautiful medicine of the North, we welcome you into this dialogue, into this summit, to awaken within each one of us that bone memory where you live as well. 
Uh -huh. Turning skyward. Grandfather Sun and Grandmother Moon, our star sisters and brothers and others. We thank you for shining down your light upon us. We thank you, Grandmother Moon, for reminding us how to bring those things that we sometimes hold in shadow into the light over and over again. Not only those difficult things we hold in shadow, but also those precious things, our genius, our beauty, and how to bring that into the light as well, so that we may deliver our medicine in this world during these times. Grandfather, son, we thank you for showing up every day and reminding us how to show up every day, how to fall down seven times and get up eight, always eight. Much gratitude to the great above. We thank you for shining down that light upon us and reminding us too that we can shine as a beacon of light by the way we live our lives so you can see us from out there. Much gratitude, we welcome you, I hope. Mm, Mother Earth, Pachimama, to the great dreaming, we thank you for this place that we call home, for community and belonging, the spirit of Earth, the medicine of Earth, the connection that you offer and the reminders of how to live in balance. We thank you for teaching us that scarcity is an illusion, only brought about when we live out of balance with you. We thank you, Pachimama, for holding us and reminding us once again to dream and to connect again with your dreaming so that we may dream, redream a new planet directed by soul. Much gratitude. I hope. To the ancestors on whose shoulders we stand. We thank you for dreaming us into this place. We thank you for your tears and your laughter, your stories, your dreams and visions. And for those ancestors standing in front of us, we thank you for the way that you are watching to see how we live our lives. So you will know what to do when you get here. We thank you for that accountability and for that trust. And may the way in which we live our lives be a blessing to all our peoples, human and non-human peoples. Much gratitude, I hope. And a deep breath and returning to this conversation. Thank you so much for that, Keith. It really sends a nice ah, message out to the planet and the universe that what we're up to here in this summit is truly sacred and transformative. Um, so, so much gratitude to you for that. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. It helps, helps give me something adequate to say so I'm not over here struggling by myself. <laughs> Well, it's a beautiful container and context for starting us off um, in this week long experience. And um, your work is so beautiful and so important in terms of putting into action the new dream of the world that, that you invoked there in, in that for us. And I would just love for you to share with us a little bit about the work that you do at the Rites of Passage Council and why you do that work. Well, I would definitely say it's, it's been a soul-led journey of, uh, of arriving here. And um, here's just, you know, the place I'm at before there. So it's not, not, a, not that there's any destinations or acquisitions to, to finally get to. Um, reminded in this moment of Carlos Castaneda's phrase that all, all roads or all paths go to the same place. And that is they all go nowhere. However, some will have heart or soul, we could say, and some will not. And so it's uh, certainly been a journey of heart and soul um, in getting here. 
So the Rites of Passage Council uh, is work dedicated to the, I would say the rewilding of human nature, um, to, to reignite, to, to activate, um, uh, to, to use the word indigenous, but not to speak as a, a people's, but more as an original aliveness. Um, that, that lives within us uh, looking to be woken up and activated um, so that uh, taking people through experiences of initiatory uh, processes, uh, vision fast ceremonies, um, wilderness encounters with soul, um, various rich grief rituals and um, just, just bringing people back into the connection with, with nature as a way to activate a deeper listening um, and a deeper attunement to, the, to their own nature in connection with, um, with a more broader field or, or dreaming. Um, so that this, this idea that we're not uh, simply operating alone. You know, when you talk about your, your summit being called soul-led businesses. And I began to think about soul um, and not just the individual soul, but the collective soul of, of uh, the planet and the dreaming of the planet and this alignment of connection and responsibility um, that rises up out of just that essence and how um, to be directed toward a, a, the delivery of... Um, soulful work or soulful medicine offerings, I would call it. Um, I believe it's, it's in all of us um, that from, a, from various indigenous perspectives, I've, I've heard tell of this, this way of understanding that we, we come here from the realm of our ancestors carrying medicine that's needed in the world at the time that we come. And before coming here, we make agreements with certain ancestors, uh, so maybe even ancient ancestors that are aligned with that same kind of medicine that we have to offer. And so once arriving here, initiatory rites of passages and experiences of initiation, be them intentional or accidental, because we all go through many of them, um, are designed to realign us with that, those agreements, I would say, those, those the memory of who we came here to be, the, the memory of, of aligning us with the delivery of that medicine that we came here to deliver. Um, and so in my own story, how did I, uh, well, just Rites of Passage Council uh, really focused on nature immersion experiences um, with a soulful focus and connecting people deeply uh, to each other um, and the other than human others um, in nature and, and learning how to listen and receive. Um, my own journey of arriving here was, uh, let's see, I always wonder where to start with this one. Um, so we were talking about my name and the, the challenges of having a name nobody can say and nobody can spell <laughs> since birth. Um, but the name itself uh, carried imprints um, uh, of a particular evolutionary arc. Um, some of it about healing certain dysfunctional dynamics that uh, were in my genealogy, like all of us, we, we, we are born into that baggage. <laughs> um, so the name Cater and Stevens and my middle name were two uncles of mine and they both died prematurely. One at 19 in a car accident in Wilmington, North Carolina, ran right into a tree. I think probably having too much to drink as the story went. And then um, Cater, who died in a house fire um, at around 34. And so right away coming into this world, I, I'm carrying these signatures of, of identity and belonging. And so I almost die at birth with birth complications. And then at two and a half, I'm in a car accident, uh, like my other, like Steve, my other namesake. 
and uh, in a coma for three months. And I didn't die, obviously, of the head injury that he died of. Um, and then when I was around 14, I began to have this desire to do an initiatory rite of passage. Well, I didn't call it that. I just said I wanted to go out into the wilderness under the guidance of somebody that knew what they were doing. And, uh, and then have them take me off and drop me off and leave me out there for a while. That's all I could figure out. And nobody in my world knew what to do with that. Um, so it, it went underground into my you know, mythological consciousness. And it wasn't until my father died at 34 that it came back up. That like one of these passages actually died at 32. Um, and it rose up again and I started feeling this longing, uh, this, this unmet longing to go into the wilderness. Uh, and I was working as a therapist at the time in private practice and I would drive by these sections of forest on the way to work and I would just start to weep. I, I just, I wanted to, even now when I touch it, I can feel that grief and I just wanted to get out of the car and walk, just disappear into the woods. And, um, and I found my way to this thing called Vision Quest Ceremony. I thought, okay, that's what I wanted to do when I was 14. And, um, and I, you know, in, in the wake of my father's death, kind of in that tumultuous change, um, knowing that I needed to do something, um, I walked out of a, just having dropped my, my daughter off, my oldest daughter off at a daycare, and, and I just came out of daycare, and it's a two-lane country road in front of me, you know, and, and it's out in rural South Carolina, and going down the road, as I, I walk out contemplating, I've I got to do something here, and I look up, and coming down the road are three covered wagons drawn by horses, and I always think to say, I'm not hallucinating, they're actually there, and uh, and on the side of it, in big bold letters, it says Vision Quest. And then um, I went home that night and I was working with these sacred path cards. And uh, so I pulled them out and laid them out on the floor and face down and drew one, said a prayer, drew one, it said Vision Quest. Shuffled them up, not convinced, I'm hard headed. <laughs> pulled another one, Vision Quest. Three times I pulled the same card from different places. And I'm feeling this, something's up with this. Like this is, this is really important. Um, not yet convinced, uh, but beginning to definitely lean in that direction. Um, I had been invited to a church of a friend of mine. Oh, backing up a little bit. When my father died, he came to me right after his death and we met in the library. And he pulled a book off the shelf and gave it to me and it said Vision Quest. And again, he sold Mack trucks. This was not his world when he was alive, but he had done some reading since he departed, I guess. And uh, so back, flash forward, that was the first thing that happened, flashing forward to this visit to this church. So I'm in the church and I'm through the service and I'm thinking about what to, you know, should I do this vision quest thing? I'm imagining being up on this mountain and having to deal with everything that comes up that, that uh, that you have to deal with when you're realigning yourself with your your soul's directive, and um, and I thought about my background in, in Catholicism, kind of my first taste of ritual. And for me, it wasn't a bad experience, but it just wasn't where I was then. And I thought, you know, just in honor of my ancestry and history, I'm going to carry a small cross, put it in my medicine pouch, and whatever I have to deal with on that mountain on that quest, I'll just, I'll face it. And uh, the service ended and I got a tap on the shoulder and I turned around and there was this old man and old woman that had to be around six, four, six, five, because I had to look up to them and I'm six, one, and they were both taller than me. And they both had long gray hair, which was unusual in this small rural town in South Carolina. And they both looked at me and the man looked directly at me and he said, I'm supposed to give you this. And he put that small cross in my hand right at that moment. And I was I just put out my hand. I was, you know, all I could say was thank you. I was at a, a loss for even thoughts. Um, the last thing that happened, not the last thing, but the next thing that happened 
I was studying the medicine wheel and I'd gone down to work out at this gym that I usually go to and I was down in the locker room getting ready to go back to work and see clients and nobody was down there and I reached out and opened my locker and something shot out of the locker and hit me right in the center of the chest so hard that it made me jump and startled me and I looked around and thought somebody had thrown something at me and nobody was down there and uh, and I looked down on the floor and there's four feathers and they're red yellow black and white and they're taped together to give them a little bit of heft as a dart and I thought what, like where did this come from and I looked at the, the locker trying to make sense out of how maybe it fell off the top but there was no top to it it just went to the ceiling and I do remember seeing kind of out of the flash of my something coming straight at me and uh, um, again at the time I was studying medicine wheel work and so by then I went and talked with uh, a friend of mine who had done some work with the Sun Bear tribe and he just basically said you better go do this ceremony or they're not going to be nice about this forever <laughs> going to they're going to get a little bit rougher so far it's been nice and enjoyable but you keep you know asking questions and it's time to take action so I decided to go apprentice with some folks in California, Stephen Foster and Meredith Little in the early 90s. Flash forward to the last night of this four day, uh, four night quest. I'm sitting on the mountain about 9,000 feet up in the Sierra Nevadas, watching the moon track across the sky one more night. And this is that symbolic death and rebirth night. And it occurs to me that this, this particular night is uh, September 20th, 1994, exactly two years to the very night that my father died. Um, that I, and I got to be with him in that passage. So it, it had come full circle. And when I came down off the mountain, I just knew that this is, this is the direction I'm going. Um, and I began to shift everything over from more of a counseling practice to more of doing this work and, and bridging that clinical world and that shamanic indigenous world together. So that's how I came uh, to it. And I, so I see it more as a, of a memory than kind of like figuring out what to do. It's like I think these things are in all of us as memories. Um, so it's not that you need to learn what to do it's that you simply remember what to do and you remember it through these initiatory experiences so that's the nutshell of how i ended up on this that long and dusty road <laughs> thank you for sharing that story what i love about it is that it brings up a couple of really important um ideas in terms of dreaming the new dream of the world and mm -hmm. that is paying attention to signs mm -hmm. and uh trusting those signs mm -hmm. and then um taking action on them mm -hmm. even though we don't necessarily know what will unfold and what will happen right and and you just described the formula that i figured out in terms of practical magic, we could call it. If, if somebody wanted to put this practical magic to the test, um, all that's necessary to do is to, to still yourself, to quiet your mind, um, and ask yourself the question, what is it that I most want to do right now? And I don't mean with your life, I would love mean right now, like in this moment. Um, and if you've got enough container of time, uh, once that awareness comes to you, and it's not, you don't arrive at it by thinking, you arrive at it by receiving it. It doesn't require that it makes sense. It, may, it likely won't make sense. Um, but I say as long as it falls within the, the, the banks of your integrity to do it, then simply do it and then watch what happens next. So in, in doing it, you, you take the action 
and, and let, again, let it be close in, kind of like David White's poem called uh, Start Close In, not with the second or the third thing, the first thing, close in. The moment you take that action, and it simply could, for instance, I was, uh, I remember many years ago as at work, and I had this three hour opening in my schedule I wasn't expecting. And uh, so I was working, I was applying this, this uh, practice back then and seeing how it worked. And so I thought, first I thought I'm gonna run, go get something to eat and come back to the office. I said, no, 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 don't do that. That's very habitual. <laughs> so let's stop and let's really drop in and see. And I thought, hmm, I wanna go down to the park near the river and just walk, walk over to the river and see it, that's all. And I was living on the Savannah River at the time and so I drove down to this park and parked my car and got out of it. And some several hundred yards away, I saw another car park. Uh, it seemed like the only other one down there. And I just saw a man get up. I didn't pay attention. I walked to the river. And when I got down to the river, I was just standing there looking at the river, feeling grateful. And, and I heard footsteps behind me and I turned around and that man was standing there. And he said, are you from Asheville, North Carolina? And I said, actually, yes. <laughs> I had a bumper sticker on my a tag on my car, but that's how he knew that. But anyway, he had followed me down there. And I said, yeah, I just moved up there, but I'm maintaining my practice here. And, uh, and he said, well, I'm from Nashville too. I, I work down here and I'm moving up there just like you. I'm going back and forth. And I thought, huh, isn't that interesting? I said, well, tell me about yourself. <laughs> And then we got into a conversation about his son who's 14 and you know, mom's having a hard time with this son. And so we had a great conversation. When I got back to the office, I realized, huh, that's why I was, that's why I was supposed to go to the river um, to meet this man who showed up at the same time I did. Um, so I got to find out in that experience. Other times you don't get to know. You know, one time I said, it said, you know, close your computer, it was late at night, close your computer, go into the backyard and lay down beneath the oak tree. And I did. And this leaf fell on my nose. And I don't know to this day what that was about. <laughs> and, uh, but what happens is that what we could call our ancestral spirit helpers or guides, are always looking to communicate with us. Um, whatever the name you call, have for the sacred, we'll call that. Um, and when we listen, they say, oh, they're listening, let's communicate more. Um, and so it strengthens the communication with the sacred. And so when, when, when you approach the other world with reverence, the other world approaches you as well and it's and it's a way to strengthen you know, when we talk about soul based soul based is not ego directed um, in terms of work or passion it, it is uh, leaning into something greater than ourselves even greater than our own individual soul that we listen to um, that we learn to connect with um, and be guided by and um, and so having a means of communication that we can uh, begin to tap into regularly and listen and so it involves a lot more listening than talking um, anyway those are some initial thoughts that, that come to mind with with your words thank you i something that's coming up repeatedly as, as you're sharing is the idea that in our culture right now, especially this year of 2020, when we're recording this, it's really been an initiatory year with all kinds of things um, arising, causing stress and a sense of disease, disease and physical disease. Um, you know, the political situation in the United States and globally is really um, in an intense moment. And 
And many people are sharing that they feel lost or they feel untethered and disconnected mm -hmm. from what it is they're meant to do. And um, what I found in my own life practice and following those messages, just as you've described in my own way, is that it's a coming back to the natural world um, that actually helps us reconnect with what, what is being asked of us mm -hmm. and how we can come back into wholeness with ourselves. And in doing that, um, in that stillness, you mentioned meditation. Other people might try journaling or walking. Whatever the way in mm -hmm. is when we come back into union with the natural world, mm -hmm. it really helps us to reset and have that presence and that, that quietness mm -hmm. to come out of our ego and, and into our hearts. Right. So yeah, the, to, to follow your, your thread, this kind of to extrapolate this out to the global picture. Um, so it is as if we were, we globally are in this initiatory passage um, and looking at it from the eyes of an old rites of passage guide like myself, what I see is that we've been, we've been put up on the mountain. Um, we've gone through the severance phase, the death lodge as it's called. And we've, we've been either voluntarily or involuntarily severed from old ways of being, old, old, uh, old comfortable ways of being that are, um, and, and pulled forward by some, some greater force unconcerned with the comforts of a life we have outgrown. <laughs> it is not concerned with that. Um, and sadly, and, and, tr and yet honestly, as in all initiatory processes, not everyone survives the threshold. And, and, and we offer, you know, an awareness to those that have fallen during this particular global threshold that, that didn't make the crossing, at least on this physical plane. Um, and so it's, you know, even, even uh, we, we carry across this threshold for all the ones that didn't make it as well during this time. And yet what happens when you go up on the mountain uh, to quest. Well, what happens is everything you've repressed and denied and held in shadow rises up. And it wants to be, it wants to come to the table and have a conversation. Um, it will not be denied. It will not be, uh, you know, overlooked. Um, and so we see that. We see uh, racism rising up once again, and it's calling for conversation the oppression uh, of many people is rising up, calling for conversation. You know, all these different things that have been repressed and denied globally are now rising up in their inner face, demanding conversation um, in a different, a different narrative, a different way of being in relationship. Um, and this is what happens during the threshold phase of an initiatory process. Um, is we have to face these gatekeepers, I call them gatekeepers, um, that need to be reconciled before we can make a clear passage. I don't think it's the first time in history. Um, and I think that one can go into a threshold passage and survive it, but not have a, what I call a complete passage, because nothing changed. Um, they just endured it. Um, the other thing that happens during the threshold phase, and you alluded to this, is that th there is a, a need to reach out to something greater than our own limited capacity to dream uh, in, in our own uh, strategic thinking mind, you know, and, and those that can't or are afraid to or don't have a, uh, uh, a way to configure uh, that other than, yeah, that's just, you know, we're going to suffer because it, it's, it's a time where, you know, if you don't have something like that to, to lean into, um, then you feel utterly alone. 
Um, and this too is what happens, you know, in, in that threshold period um, to be broken open from inside or outside forces uh, that calls us to reach out to something greater than ourselves. Even if all we can do is cry or say help, <laughs> they, the, the other world understands that uh, more than cleverly uh, choreographed words. It understands the heart, the emotion. And, and, um, and at that moment, we make ourselves available, not only individually, but globally to grace, to enter and find its way in. And as we know, grace by definition uh, just comes out of nowhere. It's not even deserved or undeserved, or it's not a controlled thing. That's so why I say we can only make ourselves available to it. Um, we can't guarantee that it shows up. Um, and so it's a yeah time for um, opening ourselves to grace. Um, time to go to our our altars or our, our ancestral helping spirits and just say you know hey we're 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 a bit lost here. Um, go into nature. Um, those words you were saying about nature. When we go into nature, undisturbed nature. Uh, for a large part, not completely. It's hard to find complete undisturbed nature on the planet these days, but um, nature vibrates at a certain frequency that is very different than what we hold in our bodies. And so, as it said, I forgot who said this, but if you ever want to get clear about something, first you have to get really confused. That's step one. We, we're there. <laughs> Step two is you go into a place, if you can go into a place in nature, eliminate all distractions, time and food being major ones, and, uh, and others, um, and stay there long enough, you'll begin to uh, uh, discharge all the anxiety and and inner spinning dialogue that may take a few days to do it. And then it begins to quiet. And then you can begin to hear, then you begin to resonate at a different frequency. Your attunement and your awareness expands um, to a much broader, expansive and, and more aware state. Um, and you begin to remember. First, you may remember painful things because that's part of what's moving out. And you know, all these gatekeepers are coming up. But we feel those, we, we, we sit with those and we, we feel through them and we hopefully heal those. And, then, and on the other side of those, um, you know, is grace and is, is a deeper awareness um, to where we can remember this, this path of uh, what we call inspiration. Um, to align ourselves with the way of being and doing in the world um, that has been there waiting all along for us to show back up. <laughs> Hasn't gone anywhere, it's just been patiently waiting, waiting. Um, it's like, oh, there you are. And, um, and then there's the coming off the mountain, you know, where say we're this, this period of the threshold that we've been in uh, and then coming off the mountain with a new story, with a new alignment. You know, us, um, there's certain ritual uh, suggestion, maybe I'll have one by the end of this way to, to do, this, do this aligning for each person, but um, this alignment with a, uh, a much broader dreaming um, that's not limited to simply human peoples, um, because as Chief Seattle said, you know, anything we do to the web of life, we do to ourselves. And anything we do to ourselves, we eventually do to the other. It's like it's not disconnected. Um, and so this uh, coming off the mountain requires to come off with uh, a, a story that's in front of us, you know. Some come out of these initiatory experiences with what we'd say a new name. These people take on new names, but 
the names, I just like to remind people that medicine names are about the story that's in front of you. It's not meant to be a description of what we see in your character. It's meant to be a roadmap for the road ahead. And this, uh, and this way of uh, living into that story, living into that name, um, something we can you know, pass on to our descendants. Um, and so the, you know, the capacity to imagine, to reignite our imagination, um, our creativity. Uh, I'm reminded of, of Joanna Macy, actually I think it was Carl Jung, and then later Joanna Macy that, that ignited the phrase that there's, a, there's one great question that lives within each one of us. And you're very fortunate if you can find it because it becomes a thread to follow. Um, and so the, the activation of that, that life, that thread to, to follow that. Um, because, you know, each of you and each of us, you know, we came here to deliver a certain kind of medicine. And it's and if you don't do it, it's not going to happen. That's 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 a the old better and less than way of thinking about it. oh somebody does that or somebody does this or I shouldn't do that. There's too many people doing this already. It's like well, there's nobody being you, <laughs> and if you don't be you, then we don't get to experience the medicine that you have to offer. Um, and so yeah, we, we're. I think we're still on the mountain and we're beginning to contemplate coming down and how are we going to come down off this mountain? Um, and what will be the new story that we, we braid together like sweet grass and, and begin to, uh, you know, to offer. Um, and nothing's, you know, there are no guarantees. Um, I say that as, they say all, all roads are simply going to go nowhere, but which one has heart and soul and which one doesn't? And then follow that one. So. As you're describing that rite of passage and I'm, I'm reflecting on the work that you do, um, you know, I'm thinking about as we, we reach the top of the mountain and we have uh, we feel all of the things, the, the shadow, all the things that we need to let go of. And we move into that place where we've, we've let go and we've mm -hmm. created space for what might come. Mm -hmm. And we bring the picture of the new story into mm -hmm. our hearts. Mm -hmm. And we start to make that journey down the hill. Um, is that to you the space in which people step into what you call evolutionary leadership? Yes, that would be the, the evolutionary leadership is the, the work of bringing that narrative, that story, that vision, that inspiration into form. Um, that it is, it is, uh, connected with through forces greater than ourselves, our ego and our strategic mind. It's, it, it, and it's in service to something greater than ourselves or greater than human selves. Um, and so when it has that kind of alignment, both the avenue of getting to it is, is uh, a road of, uh, a path of some sacred choreography um, and the manifesting of the vision um, it is, uh, is really an exercise of faith, um, but, it's, but it's fueled by something greater than ourselves. To be in service to something greater than ourselves is, is uh, I always say, tell people, um, stay humble and stay focused. Um, humble is to remind you that you are responsible, but you're not in charge. Focus is to for picking yourself up each time you get knocked down <laughs> or stumble. Um, and so the, and often the hardest part of the initiatory journey is the return, you know, as, and, and, and uh, the book Black Elk speaks, he, he speaks, uh, he said, you know, it's easy to go up on the mountain and have a vision. Anybody can do that. 
He said, but we don't really say you had a vision until you make it real for people to see. Then we'll tell you, then we'll say he had a vision or she had a vision or they had a vision. And this, um, and, and so coming off the mountain is, uh, is, is what we call the giveaway. And we say, well, what is the giveaway? I say, well, that's the rest of your life is to give this away. Give this, maybe you have to go back there a few times, but to come back and keep giving away this, this medicine so that your descendants can one day dig it out of the ground and, and make sense of their lives. Um, but yeah, the, 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 um, the leadership piece, um, evolutionary leadership is that, uh, that arc of uh, following that thread of inspiration and soul connected vision and, uh, and responsible action uh, with integrity um, that, that moves it forward. And also to, to not reach for a, a particular destination or acquisition as if somehow those will be markers of, okay, I'm finished. It's like, oh no, there's, there is no destination or no, there's nothing to acquire. There's simply the delivery of more and more of this beauty that you each carry. Um, and so that when we do, you know, when we're finally ready to cross, make that final crossing to, to the world of our ancestors, that way we, we do so leaving you know, some breadcrumbs right there at the threshold. Um, for the ones to follow. That's yeah, what I call evolutionary leadership. <laughs> thank you for sharing that. And I think it's so important within the context of profitable soul led business because the way um, the term business, it makes sense for this world, mm -hmm. but where we're actually going is, is to a place of of calling mm -hmm. and of being of service mm -hmm. and as i see we're in this bridge time between the cultural paradigm that we're in to this next world um, we are taking those steps of saying okay i know that something is wanting to be birthed through me and i'm in this reality and i um it's important to welcome in money in order for me to have a level of safety and security mm -hmm. that I can provide for myself and others who perhaps rely on me um, and be able to have a surplus, not mm -hmm. only of energy um, for myself and the work that I do in the world, but also perhaps a surplus to help uplift others. Um, and therefore, when we're coming back into alignment with that soul calling, um, we are saying yes to something that may not make sense as you've touched mm -hmm. on. And it only doesn't make sense within the framework of the current world that we're in. Mm -hmm. But as we take each step, it mm -hmm. starts to make more sense. And mm -hmm. then each one of us becomes in a sense like a, an active, a radical activist of love, of self-love, because we're saying yes mm -hmm. to mm -hmm. what our ancestors and our guides and even the earth wants, wants of us to bring forth our medicine. And when we do that, we become beacons for others who perhaps aren't quite sure that they can do that for themselves. So I believe and feel that your work really helps people along on that journey. Um, and I'm so grateful to, to you uh, for listening to the messages that were given to you and helping others to bring this into their, their own lives. Yeah, it's, it's, a, it's an honor and a privilege. As I uh, mentioned before we started recording, uh, being a father of two daughters, I have some, uh, I want to see this move forward. You know, and um, this this rise of the uh, what I what I would call the the uh, rise of the the feminine, not just feminine, but the initiated feminine. Um, that it, 
that it's rising, but it's also rooted at the same time. Um, so it's, uh, yeah, I feel, feel, feel honored to be a part of the conversation. Uh, thank you. Um, okay, so is there anything else that you would like to share with us um, before we say our goodbyes? I would take, I would take uh, the listeners back to that question. What is one action I can take if I still my thoughts, my mind, uh, my distractions? And what is the one action I can take that will align me more directly with, uh, with that soul connection, with that, with that uh, essence? Again, whatever name we call the sacred. Um, and reminder to start close in. Don't ask yourself, what am I going to do with my life? <laughs> like, what, what can I do today, this evening, this next hour? Um, and it doesn't have to make sense. It only has to be within your integrity to do so. And then do it and then watch and listen to see what happens next. And then follow that. And it, it aligns us with a particular thread um, uh, that is uh, William Stafford says in his poem, The Way It Is, that there's a thread we follow that's hard to explain. And others can't see it, and it's hard to even name what it is, basically. But as long as you hold on to it, you can't get lost. <laughs> Absolutely. Thank you so much for that. I, uh, I feel that. I know I am going to practice this myself. And um, it's such a beautiful and, and sacred offering that you've shared with us today. And I'm so grateful for you. Thank you. Thank you, Jenny. Thank you again for the work that you're weaving out into our global community. Appreciate it. Yeah, it's my pleasure. All right. Go well. <laughs>